Good afternoon, and welcome to today's event, organized by Hong Kong U's newly established Center on Contemporary China and the World, known as the CCCW. My name is Li Chen. I'm a professor in the Department of Politics and Public Administration and the director of the CCCW. This is the first public event uh, that the CCCW has hosted since in, uh, in our uh, inaugural conference almost uh, a month ago. As many distinguished colleagues at the CCCW uh, who are there, who are present in this meeting, uh, they know uh, the center, our new center, is inspired by and committed to uh, what we call four Vs. We we'll started with these vision, vantage, voice, and the values. We aim to become a much needed bridge or hub for international understanding and interdisciplinary research or discourse. And more importantly, uh, a constructive force for maintaining peace across the Pacific and around the world. This is also our first event in the new year, a year that is widely believed to be quite interesting and extraordinary, as 70, about 70 countries and the regions undertake elections. Our forum today focuses on the Taiwan election, which was held just last week, uh, last weekend. As we now know from the result, major parties in Taiwan, and also Taiwanese people in general, are divided uh, sharply over the risks and the rewards of pursuing engagement with Beijing and relying on close ties with the United States. It is also interesting and important to note that some sensational views about the implication of the Taiwan election uh, which is dominated for the media, West, especially Western media, uh, for the past few um, few months or longer, are uh, ungrounded. The recent report, really, is quite excellent report by the U.S.-based influential Euro-Asia group entitled "Top Risk 2024." It's particularly insightful and foresighted in downplaying. Um, the scenarios for military conflict over the Taiwan Strait. Instead, that the report forecasts, as I quote here, three wars will dominate world affairs in 2024, namely Russia versus Ukraine, Israel versus Hamas, and the United States versus itself, or an American Civil War. I believe that the military conflict in the Taiwan Strait should, must, and can be prevented. Given this general assessment, we of course still need to pay much attention to the trajectory of the forces involved in the region, especially the question, what uh, do the Taiwanese elections outcomes portend uh, for Taiwan, for cross street relations, and for US-China relations? We simply cannot find a more appropriate and a more authoritative uh, scholar to address this question than our speaker today, Professor Jack Delir. Professor Delir is no stranger to Hong Kong U. And he was at Hong Kong U as recently as last month, early December. Uh, for over three decades, he visited Hong Kong almost every year, except during the COVID period. Uh, Jack and I have been good friends for almost uh, 20 some years. And uh, we study under the same mentor, Professor Lin White at Princeton, although Zach was in his undergraduate years as a real Princetonian, Princetonian. and I was a, reg a graduate student and therefore not an authentic one. Authentic one. This is at Princeton that they usually pay attention to undergraduate, not the, not the graduate students. With the JD from Harvard, Professor uh, Deli has long been a law professor at uh, UPenn. 
She has also served as the head of the Asia program at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia, a prominent think tank in the United States. As a world-leading scholar on Taiwan and East Asia, he is the author and the editor of numerous books on the subject, including Political Changes in Taiwan under Ma Ying-jiu, and Taiwan in the Era of Tsai Ing-wen, and the Arts Engagement Dilemmas in U.S.-China Security Relations. He arrived in Hong Kong last, uh, late last night from Taipei, where he observed election, and uh, he will return there this evening for more meetings. And uh, really, thank you so much, and uh, Zach, for finding time in your extremely busy schedule to speak at Hong Kong U. He will offer about a 40 minutes long presentation and then have a dialogue with our distinguished Hong Kong U professor, law professor, and also CCCW uh, senior fellow, uh, Liu Sida, and followed by audience Q&A. With my profound respect and gratitude, I want the audience to join me in giving applause our Hong Kong U style warm welcome to Professor Jack Delius. Uh, okay, is this thing working? Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Li Tang, for that uh, terrifically warm and somewhat intimidating introduction that I have to try to live up to now, I guess. Uh, and congratulations on your new center here. It really is uh, a spectacularly uh, useful and important enterprise, and it's great to see that the world is still uh, still creating new centers to work on on China, which, you know, at least from the U.S. perspective, I think we still see the U.S.-China as the most consequential uh, bilateral relationship out there. Uh, of course, it's a bilateral relationship that now touches everybody else in the world, being some of the things I'll talk about today. So as Li Chang mentioned, um, I've just come from Taipei as part of a sort of self-organized group of North America-based scholars who've been going to Taiwan elections for a while. I think the first one we went as an observer group uh, to was in 2000, the first Chen Shebian election, uh, back when Taiwan was worried about getting a sort of international certification that its, its democracy uh, was the real deal. Um, I think the first Taiwan election I was around for was actually Chun's first election as mayor, which was a bit of a, a surprise. So what you're going to hear today is kind of a, some undigested field notes from the last week, uh, framed a little bit by some bigger picture or questions. So I, I would agree with uh, what said about the the Eurasia report. Uh, this I think we put in the notice for this that this could be one of the most pivotal elections in Taiwan in quite some time. I think it ultimately probably is, but it's not a crisis point. Uh, it is it is actually a, a fair amount of continuity, as I'll say. Um, you know, I think obviously the Russia and Israel, Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Hamas, and Gaza uh, issue looms a bit larger. I uh, I hope it's not the case that America's unbegun civil war is a bigger deal than China's unfinished civil war is <laughs> to be described, but we'll turn to that in, in a bit. Um, so let me start here. So just quickly some things about the election itself. Uh, as you all know, uh, the incumbent party, the Min Dang, the DPP, won the presidency with 40% of the vote. That's a minority share, which is the first time that's happened in a while. Um, the question going into the election was whether uh, the Lai Ching De Xiaomechin ticket would hit the benchmark of the last real three-way election we had in Taiwan for president, which was the uh, first Chen Shui-bian election in 2000, where he had 39%. The next question was, would he hit 40%? Uh, and he did in both cases. Uh, Taiwan, several cycles ago, uh, merged its legislative and presidential elections into the same cycle. They used to be off cycle. And what we saw here is the DPP, the, the ruling party, lost its majority and lost a fair number of seats. You can see the trend through three, the last three legislative electoral cycles where the DPP has now fallen uh, below a majority as it, and is indeed, again, the second largest party in parliament. Uh, the way Chi Taiwan's parliament works, if, if you don't happen to know this, is it's a sort of weird hybrid. It has 73 seats that are elected in single member districts around the island. Uh, and those have the same kind of logic as American politics. That is, it tends to be one of the two major parties that win. It's very hard to feel like field the candidate, it's very hard to have the apparatus uh, to get known and to get votes. Uh, but there's another 34 seats that are done on a party slate basis. That is, you vote for a party and the parties have their lists and the parties put their most favored people at the top of the list. Uh, and that one uh, went a bit differently. Um, eight of those seats 
this time went to a new party called uh, the Minjungnai, the Taiwan People's Party, or the TPP. Uh, the rest basically were split among the KMT and the DPP with uh, a leaning toward the KMT. It's actually a little better for them in that some of these non-party people are basically KMT aligned. So we're going to have uh, something of a split government. I should also say, just in the interest of full picture here, Taiwan's legislature also includes six seats from multi-member districts for the very small Aboriginal population. If you want your vote really to count, be a Taiwanese Aborigine, uh, that is, you get you get to, to be part of a very small constituency that elects six uh, seats in, in really a sort of two two chunks of districts, not worth getting into the details. Um, so it is, you know, it is the, the pattern that happened here is I think one that is that showed that the polls were basically right. That is, if you compare to what people expected going in, uh, this was a result that was slightly greener and slightly whiter and slightly less blue than expected. That is, the DPP came out at the high end of its expected presidential vote titles, totals that came at the high end of its expected legislative slate. Uh, and the um, the the upstart uh, uh, Taiwan People's Party uh, did better than expected in the presidential vote, clearing uh, you know more than a quarter of the vote and getting eight seats on the proportional representations. So that's sort of the nuts and bolts of this. And the turnout was pretty good, with seventy two percent roughly, which is the range Taiwan's usually in. It's a little lower than some of the more heated elections in recent times, but it's it's a pretty good turnout rate. Whoops. Right. What's striking about this election is that um, it's a third term, and it's the first time in Taiwan's democratic history that you've had the same party win a third uh, term, so it was a bit of an uphill slog uh, for the DPP. Uh, and that's, you know, really, I think, quite remarkable because voters in Taiwan, like voters everywhere, tend to be pretty dissatisfied. There was a lot of uh, complaints about uh, the DPP has been in power too long. Uh, and has failed to solve problems and, and therefore uh, took some hits on that front. This is also interesting in that unlike in prior cycles, the outgoing incumbent president, who is limited to two four-year terms, was actually pretty popular. Uh, Chen Shui-bin was not popular when he left office in 2018. Ma Ying-jeou was not popular when he left office in 2016. Tsai was still doing pretty well. Uh, and uh, you know, she was actually an active campaigner. Uh, for her successor, which is kind of remarkable since her successor, who is her vice president, did try to unseat her <laughs> when she tried to run for a second term. So there's, there's some complexity in their relationship. So it is remarkable to get this um, this uh, this kind of, of, of turnout. Um, but again, well, only a minority vote. So, so the thing that, that this was striking about this election that makes a big difference is uh, what Taiwanese call the Kilpi phenomenon, uh, Kilwenja, who is uh, who, who did this, this third party. Uh, it's kind of a uh, a one-person party. And what he did was capture the discontent vote. Uh, he captured people who didn't like the DPP or the KMT. The people who don't like both parties tend to be younger. Uh, the, the KMT has a very hard time attracting young people because it's seen as sort of the old nationalist party and most of its leaders are fairly elderly too. Uh, and it has been on the conservative side of a lot of social issues that motivate young voters. The DPP, I think, is actually a little surprised at how much trouble it's having with young voters because they got a lot of them in 2020. Part of that, frankly, was motivated by what happened in Hong Kong in 2019. Uh, but there's also a sense that many young voters in Taiwan have grown up only knowing the DPP in power. I mean, if you're in your early 20s, uh, you haven't seen a non-DPP government in your political lifetime. So that dissatisfaction uh, kind of led to support for Ko and Jia. Um, also, Kalinja said, look, I am not only anti-establishment, I am also the one who doesn't want to talk about China all the time. The other guys always want to talk about China. Let's talk about local stuff. So he did pretty well with that. And if we went around to the rallies, we went to the, to the rallies. If you get the chance, go to Taiwan for elections for the rallies. They're great fun. Everybody's out till 10 o'clock and partying and yelling and shouting. Um, but the, the Kuh rallies were different. People were, were less sort of, you know, in sync, cheering. But it looked kind of like a bunch of young people in, in Lang Kwai Fung. I mean, they were hanging out, <laughs> having a good time, hanging out with one another, and sort of a, sort of paying attention to Kuh. But it was a very different uh, dynamic. All right. So what I want to do is, is, having told a couple anecdotes there, take a step back and, and talk about what we saw go on in this election. There was um, a real sort of complex set of personnel choices and, 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 and who the candidates and their chosen vice presidents were. So green, white, and blue, the DPP, the TPP, and the KMT. Uh, you probably know this, but I'll give you the quick uh, thumbnail sketch. Um, Lai Qingde, the president-elect of Taiwan, is somebody who has been in, the, in DPP politics for a very long time. 
he was the vice president in size second term uh, after trying to become the presidential candidate uh, in that same round. Uh, he was a vice, he was a premier, the prime minister under Tsai in her first term. And he had served in the legislature, the legislative UN for a while. And he probably most famously earlier in his career been the mayor of, of Tainan, a, a large city uh, in Taiwan, and had, had actually unseated. Um, I'm sorry, I don't want to get too into the weeds here. Anyway, he, he had basically uh, been a, a significant player in DPP politics. Uh, Hu Yi, the KMT uh, candidate, was a cop. Uh, you know, he was, his career was in the police system. He might rose to very high levels in that area uh, and went into politics fairly late and actually unseated as mayor of Xinbei, the big city right next to Taipei, uh, having defeated Su Zhengchang, who was a stalwart and a, and a, and a premier under Lai as well. So these are these are both guys who have been in politics for a while, Ho for less of a period, but who have sort of uh, held significant electoral positions. They've worked their way up in that sense. That makes them different from... Tsai Ing-wen, who really didn't have much in the way of elective offices before becoming president, and different from Ko Wen-ju in a way because he entered politics at a high level uh, as an independent candidate for mayor. Uh, he's a doctor. He loves to tell you that he was a doctor. He loves to tell you he's a really smart doctor and a really smart guy, so he could fix everything. I like Ching-do as a doctor, too. You don't hear as much about that. Uh, but but Ko wen -ju came in and basically said, I am the anti-establishment candidate. And I have been the independent mayor of Taipei. Now, he started out being actually backed by the DPP in his first run for mayor and then kind of drifted away from them. But he's, he's self-consciously iconoclastic. So you had these, the way the Taiwan politics process, these three candidates were identified fairly early on, and they don't name vice presidential candidates until very near the end. And there we saw something which I think reflects some of the earlier patterns in this election that I was talking about. Lai ching -de chose as his running mate, uh, Xiao Mei Qin, Xiao Bi Kim who is um, beloved by Americans, right? She speaks native English, went to Oberlin, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but, but basically she had she assuaged concerns in the United States about whether Lai Ching-do could handle the complexities of cross-strait relations and whether he could be reined in being too pro-independence. So it was a signal to the US not to worry. And it was a way of energizing the frankly kind of apathetic and frustrated DPP base to try to get the young voters and others who came to their rescue in 2020 uh, to come back. Hoyoyi did something very different. He went deep blue. He went to the end of his party that was much more sort of associated with the mainlander tradition in Taiwan, a little more pro-China, if I can use that term here, to shore up the base. He, the thing that made Ho an interesting and, and high potential candidate was he was a KMT Taiwanese, uh, you know, sort of Li Donghui type, except with different politics. Uh, and so he needed to shore up the base within the party. That was a kind of early sign of weakness. In a way, Lai could go with somebody who more or less shared his view and had to worry about external issues, but Ho had to, to kind of pull the party back together. And then you get the fun things that always happen. There's always a little October surprise, right? That we call it in America. Something on the eve of the election that scrambles things. So Mang Jo, the former president, gives an interview to Deutsche Welle Radio, uh, which has played an, a strangely large role in time. Politics. Uh, I think there are only a few of us in the room who are old enough to remember this, uh, but the current phase of, of cross-strait tensions in many ways dates to Li Donghui, the first democratically elected president in Taiwan. And one of the things that really created cross-strait friction was when in, on July 1st, 1999, I know that's ancient history, uh, Li Donghui went to Deutsche Welle Radio and said, oh yeah, cross-strait relations are like state-to-state -state relations, or at least a special form of nation-to-nation -nation relations. Or as it is known in Chinese, Liang Guofeng, a very simple two-state uh, thesis. Well, Ma goes into an interview with, Ma, with Deutsche Welle, and most of it is pretty anodyne stuff, except he goes on to say a few things like, um, we need to trust Xi Jinping on the issue of unification. Unification is constitutionally acceptable in Taiwan uh, because it's under the ROC constitution, which is a, essentially a one China idea. It didn't put in so many words. It'd have to be democratic and peaceful. And stuff. But this was seen as going very much toward the deep blue end of the Taiwanese political spectrum as being very pro, uh, pro China. And uh, basically the last couple days of the electoral cycle had uh, Ho Yi saying, I don't really know this guy. He's <laughs> really distancing himself from Mang Jio. They put him in a basement someplace. And the DPP grabbed it. Uh, the election eve rally and the election eve eve rally, uh, Susan Chan, the former premier, was out there with a big PowerPoint slide that had big pictures of Ma uh, and, and quotes about unification. So, you know, that probably um, at least changed the discussion, although it uh, didn't, um, I think, much change 
uh, the outcome. All right, so um, the, the again, that sort of details what happened here. I want to broaden the frame a little bit here and talk about one of the strange qualities of this election. For as long as I've been paying attention to Taiwan politics and for every electoral cycle for you know a quarter century now, we are always told that this is the election that isn't going to be just about cross straits. Right? It's finally going to be about domestic politics, domestic policy. And if you look at what the voters told pollsters they cared about, it was a list of social and economic policies. Housing prices are too high for young people to buy into the market. Child care is too expensive, which is part of the demographic problem of Taiwan's aging society. Inflation isn't too bad by world standards when people are feeling squeezed by prices, particularly on some items that have gone up. How do we do social insurance for an aging population and provide health care at a sustainable uh, price level? Um, that sort of cluster of issues. And then sort of broadening the frame a little bit more, what is Taiwan's next economic act? How does it reinvigorate an economy which has kind of tapped out some of the existing modes of growth? How does it deal with the consequences of a degree of decoupling from China, de-risking from China, and and you know not just Taiwan doing it, but the world doing it, which has implications for Taiwan? What do we do about a green energy transition, and what does that mean for the nuclear power plants that have been a source of much controversy? This is ordinary politics, right? This is what you would expect politics and many democratic polities to be about, largely was, you know, the election was supposed to turn on that, but, you know, ultimately it didn't happen. Uh, there was a lot about that, and I'm sure that probably motivated a lot of voters, but the discussion among the campaigns remained very much about, um, about Australia issues. Sorry, one thing I forgot to mention back on the slide, let me backtrack for a moment. There was an attempt to have the Ke campaign and the whole campaign unite. Joe did that too. Before he blew himself up on Deutsche Welle, he uh, he brokered a live TV disaster, uh, where and uh, Ho and Ke were supposed to you know come out with this unity ticket. It didn't work, uh, and the reason it didn't work, I think, is you know a lot of anecdotal things, but I think it says something structural about Taiwan politics that matters for its democracy going forward. That is the. Um, view was that these two parties were, these two candidates were splitting the change vote, the anti-DPP vote. The idea that you could get these two to link up is really quite difficult because Ke's ego, he's the smartest guy in the room, wouldn't want to be number two. But I think more fundamentally, the Guomindang, the KMT, faced a, a potential extinction level event if they agreed to be second to an upstart single person party. And so there was, this was very hard uh, to get that to come together. And then there were sort of more micro problems with it in that they couldn't really agree who should be on top based on polling and things like that. But I think between Ke's ego and the institutional interests of the Guomindang and not shrinking to a uh, lack of importance, I drove that. So that's actually one form of political dysfunction. Let me lead, lead me back to the lower part of the slide, which is the second form of political dysfunction. Voters wanted social and economic policy. They told all the pollsters that, uh, and they told the candidates that, and I think Kula got traction in part by saying he would do that. But ultimately, much of the campaign focused on cross-strait relations again, even Kula to some degree, but certainly the candidates who finished first and second. And I think part of what goes on here is it's particularly strange because the parties worked that far apart on actual nuts and bolts of cross-strait issues. Uh, you know, they, they basically had fairly similar pro-status quo uh, positions. They wanted to um, keep the status quo as work, keep peace and stability uh, in the Taiwan Straits, to um, uh, initiate dialogue where possible, uh, to um, uh, protect the sovereignty of the ROC slash Taiwan, however you wanted to label it, uh, and, and so on. So what it really became is this game of saying, I know you care about social economic policy, but I can't really compete on that. That long list of, of policy issues are frankly ones where the parties also didn't have huge disagreements. There were some, the KMT is more market models, the DPP is more of a state model, more progressive and things, but it's not a huge gap. And so when you're facing uh, being able to make only empty promises on social and economic policy and where there's not great gaps between the parties' positions. And you add to that that there's not all that much difference on what the cross-strait relationship should look like, at least in the short run, then what you engage in is what Taiwanese political parties have been engaged in for several cycles now. You try to disqualify the other guy on the existential issue, right? 
Uh, that is, you may or may not like me versus him on this, but if you elect him, we're doomed. Uh, the BPP says, if you elect the KMT, it's surrender to authoritarianism and the end of Taiwan democracy. The KMT says, if you elect the DPP, it's the party of war instead of the party of peace because China will invade. Y you know, did that really resonate? I don't know, but it's, it, it becomes the tactic of choice given some of the, the, the inability to do much else on um, on policy issues and, and the lack of, of policy gaps. So what this winds up doing not only is focusing on cross-strait relations, but it's actually an argument not even about what Taiwan itself should be doing in cross-strait relations. It's an argument about how China will react to what Taiwan does. So it, it, it's really, again, a strange and in many ways, politics. In the sense about tactics uh, rather than strategy, and, and it, it's about sort of uh, portraying how the tactics will be um, received. All right, so um, right. The, the elections happened, um, and we see the reactions that I think were quite ordinary, right? This is, this is very much in the mode of what's happened the last several electoral cycles. So the U.S. reaction from the White House, the State Department, AIT, is to congratulate Lai and to uh, say the U.S. will continue to strengthen informal relations. Uh, to congratulate the people of Taiwan on uh, another democratic election and to note the shared values of the United States and to express support for peace and stability in the, in the cross-strait situation, the peaceful resolution of cross-strait uh, issues, uh, and, uh, and uh, call on all sides, which means primarily China, to forego coercion. And the U.S. ritually restated the catechism of our policy. Our one China policy is based on the Taiwan Relations Act, the three communiques, and the six assurances. Not so much stressed in the immediate post-election statements, but in other framing statements was that the U.S. doesn't have a preference about the outcome. Uh, that the U.S. does not support formal Taiwan independence and so on. So what to make of all this? Well, um, one thing to be said is that the U.S. really was pretty neutral, I think, in this election. Uh, Clevenger a little worried about because he says everything on all sides of every issue, a little erratic. But between the two major party candidates, I think there was a sense that basically they had different upsides and downsides, and they kind of netted out. So the concern with Ho Yi was, is he too inexperienced in cross-strait relations and international politics uh, so that he might uh, go too far uh, in making concessions to China? He might uh, not understand where the landmines are, where the traps are. Uh, but that concern faded a bit as he brought some of the traditional Guomindang national security and, and uh, foreign policy people into a circle. For Lai Qingde, it was the opposite problem. Uh, can he be kept from showing his true independence leanings? I mean, he said a few things that got him in some hot water, like, I am a worker for Taiwan independence, he said in 2017. He later added the adjective pragmatic worker for Taiwan independence. Uh, he said uh, in the months, more, re more relevantly, in the months leading up to the election, he said that we will have achieved our goals when the ta president of Taiwan can enter the White House, uh, which, you know, that would be a degree of formal relations that would uh, be um, a bit of a problem. And he described the ROC constitution as a disaster. Now, to be fair to both Ma and Lai, uh, these are sound bites taken out of context. Ma's interview with Deutsche Welle is actually pretty boring, except for a couple of places where he blows things up. Uh, and uh, Lai's statement about the ROC constitution being a disaster was in the context of saying it's being used as a one China argument by a lot of people, and that's bad for Taiwan. And that, those concerns. Uh, and uh, Lai had to come, you know, you have to go to the imperial capital and do a ritual koto. Well, Taiwanese candidates did that uh, to Washington, uh, and they both, I think, were reasonably successful. In Lai's case, uh, picking uh, Xiao Meiqin, Xiao Bi Kim as his running mate, uh, helped move things further. China's reaction was also pretty typical. Oh, and by the way, these are things that are in bracketed that didn't get put in the initial statement. Those are mostly things were emphasized in the Xi-Biden meeting, so they're kind of backdrop about how the U.S. is not changing its position. The PRC reaction from the Taiwan Affairs Office and the Foreign Ministry is, again, pretty much what you expect. The 92 consensus, there is one China that includes Taiwan, even if on Mao's version uh, we disagree about what that is. Uh, the one China principle, the idea that Taiwan was a regional election, that the Taiwan question is an internal affair, uh, and that foreigners, including especially the United States, should not interfere uh, in uh, in the in the domestic affairs of China, including Taiwan, and a fair amount of criticism for all the foreign congratulations that came in. Statements also stressed that unification was inevitable. Uh, you can't change that historical trend. 
which it implicitly reaffirms the need to use force or the right to use force if need be, and that, that the uh, PRC would work with relevant parties, by which we mean uh, not the DPP because it doesn't accept the 92 consensus and the one China principle, uh, improving people-to-people uh, -people relations, et cetera. That's all boilerplate. The thing that was a little different is they stressed that the DPP only got 40% of the vote and only got a minority of the legislature. So the math is you guys are a minority government uh, to the extent that you are Taidu Funza, the Taiwan independence activists, as they're described, uh, you, you aren't popular uh, in Taiwan. So let me just then uh, take the, the story forward a little bit about what happens uh, going forward under Lai. His argument has been continuity, continuity, continuity. In fact, there's a TV commercial during the campaign that has Lai driving around, has Tsai driving around with Lai in the passenger seat, and they leave Tsai sort of sitting on a beach, which is kind of a weird message. But basically, the idea is that, that this is a very friendly handoff. Uh, and and uh, that was partly tapping size popularity, but it was also partly designed, designed to tell the world that Lai was going to keep continuity. Well, we don't know what the details are going to look like. Um, whenever a new president is elected, um, and this is weird because Taiwan has this four-month lag between presidential election and inauguration, there's a lot of scrambling about who's going to be on the team of, of, of advisors, particularly uh, for out the outside world, the concerns about uh, foreign policy, both cross and true foreign policy with the U.S. and places like that. And there we don't know. There have been a lot of people who've been working for Tsai for eight years, and a lot of them probably won't stay on. Uh, there's a lot of speculation and possible jockeying for position. Um, and there is um, a you know at least rumor mill going around that that sh that the vice president Xiao will be given a, a large portfolio. Uh, of U.S. policy because she's very experienced, and that was part of the point of drawing her in. On the other hand, um, given his own personal history, a little bit of a reason to be wary, wary a loyal vice president will be if they get to be too prominent. Uh, but but at least that's that's the the speculation for the moment. More interesting question is what happens in the legislature. We have a divided uh, divided parliament. There is no majority party in parliament. There's not even really a majority bloc. I mean, in the past, you could get nominally different parties, but they were basically blue or basically green. Now we have these eight TPP people who hold the balance. They're not really from a party. If you look at them individually, they're everything from leftovers from the Sunflower Movement, Shirdai Liliang, New, New Power Party, to people who are basically slightly light blue KMT types. There's really a wide range, uh, even at the top of the ticket. So among these eight, there's not a lot of coherence, and it's not clear that Ke can really control them the way you would control members of, a, of an institutionalized party. So that's going to be uh, an interesting thing to watch how they hang together and what the DPP can offer them to, um, to work with them. Now, Taiwan is a quasi-parliamentary, quasi-presidential, half-and-half system, so you have this strange thing where the premier does not need majority support in the legislature. He's appointed by the president. But still, stuff has to go through the legislature. And in Taiwan's legislature, even a minority party has a lot of power to block things. We may be in for a fairly bumpy ride there. There's a there's this convoluted mechanism where the legislature could make a no-confidence vote, vote in ousting the premier, and then the premier ousts the premier or keeps the premier and dissolves the legislature, uh, which has never happened. And I think would and usually, you know, comparative politics research tells us the minority party in a coalition gets whacked when it brings down the government. So there's no real incentive to do that. So we're likely to just see um, a kind of difficult slog on legislation. Of particular concern to the outside world is what will happen with the defense appropriations. Taiwan does its big arms purchases through special legislative packages, not part of the general budget. Those are always contentious. Uh, it had been a friction point between the U.S. and Taiwan that had abated in recent years. Most parties now, all the parties now say they're pro-defense spending, but not necessarily at the same level or in the same form. But the thing that most concerns people outside Taiwan, in addition to the defense spending, is this question of, of, uh, of, of strategy abroad. And here I think you'll see uh, continuity. Again, Lai's statements have stressed uh, very Tsai-like language. He's going to follow the road that she laid out. There will be continuity, stability, peace, and support for the status quo, which is actually a little more controversial, but he plunked that way. He has pledged to, to govern these issues in accordance with the ROC constitution, which at least includes some light one China element, insists continually on Taiwan's sovereignty without formal independence, and will engage with the mainland only on a basis of equality and without preconditions. And he stresses the solidarity with fellow democracies and the support from the United States, so pretty much what we've been hearing for years. But we do have this question about whether the other lie may rear his dark green head. I think probably not in the near term. 
but these are all sort of of the moment. What I want to say is that I think as we go forward, lie is going to be yet another variation on a very long-term strategy that Taiwan has pursued from the Chen years, through the Ma years, through the Tsai years, and into the future. Now, it takes very different forms, but the basic idea is Taiwan wants to protect itself by looking and acting as much like a state as it can in the international system. So under green governments, that has taken the form of very robust statements about Taiwan is sovereign and independent, even though it has no need to not declare formal independence. It has taken the form of trying to join any international organization that will have it, sometimes under silly names like Chinese, as opposed to the Danish Taipei that we all love to visit. Uh, it, it, will, it will seek participation short of membership uh, where it can. That was the WHO uh, during 2008 to 2016, and it tries to do that across a range of other institutions, and occasionally it gets full membership in big deal organizations where statehood is not a requirement, for instance, the WTO. The second strand, in addition to joining or at least participating in international institutions, is to try to retain robust external relations. That means formal diplomatic relations with a handful of small countries. And if you can tell what the flag is for each country, uh, you get a lot of points. Uh, they're, they're fairly obscure places. Uh, but much more importantly for Taiwan, having robust informal relations with the US, Japan, uh, and increasingly Europe, including particularly former Soviet bloc countries that, that have, have uh, for a variety of, of kind of um, scared anti-authoritarianism uh, come into line. The final strand in Taiwan's participation or Taiwan's strategy is to engage in as if participation. That is, Taiwan is not allowed to join the UN Human Rights Covenants, is not allowed to join the UNFCCC and a variety of other such things. So what it does is this kind of pantomime. It acts as if it were a member of all these arrangements uh, and submits its reports and, and, and swears. Uh, to uphold those laws, law of the sea in the same bucket. So those strategies, I think, will continue. They'll be toward the greenish end, and that we'll see stronger statements of state-like status, and we'll see uh, less opportunity for full engagement because China will push back. So as that suggests, a lot of the question is, what does China do? Um, I mean, China has much more agency here. Uh, Beijing has much more agency than, than Taipei does. And again, the initial reactions, I said the usual stuff with a minor twist about, hey, you guys didn't get very many votes. But we'll see on the Chinese side, I think, too, is a uh, continuation of a long-term strategy, again, adjusted in small ways uh, for things that happen month to month. We're going to continue, I think, the cold piece, as it were. That is, you won't see more engagement with the Lai administration than you did with the Tsai administration. Uh, Beijing painted Tsai as the devil incarnate. They painted Lai as worse. Uh, so if the, if the amp is already turned up to 11, 12, uh, it sort of just goes along uh, with a similar uh, broad approach uh, with no um, real peer engagement, but a lot of quiet engagement. At the working level, a lot of stuff has gone on under, under green governments. ECFA is there. And you'll see a lot of that kind of low-level stuff. I think you'll see continuing restrictions on Taiwan's international space. We've seen China ratchet up the pressure at the UN and using the UN resolution at 2758, the, the resolution that handed the Chinese seat over from the ROC to the PRC. Uh, China has been pushing very hard to say that is a general principle of international law applicable to Taiwan's status more generally. Um, Taiwan's not getting into the CPTPP or the RCEP or any other such arrangements. Um, and Taiwan looks like it's going to lose a few more diplomatic partners. Uh, for flag fans out there, that's Nauru. Uh, it's Nauru's flag there, that, that just switched, I think, yesterday. Uh, so uh, the lobby of the foreign ministry's flag collection is looking a little, a little sparse. Um, and I think you'll see, you know, gray zone activities continue to be an issue. Now, some of that is contingent. Uh, that is, uh, when China engages in really robust military exercises, it, it has upsides of putting pressure on Taiwan and even eroding its military readiness. But, but China is in a better position to do that when somebody does something that gives them an excuse. Well, the Pelosi visit uh, was seen as sufficiently provocative that the China could do kind of what it wanted to do anyway. So these, these, these gray zone um, type um, uh, undertakings, I think, will continue. So again, more of the same, not likely to be a war. Um, when I teach torts to American law students, one of the things we teach them is when you figure out how much it's worth in, in investing to prevent a risk, you care about two things. How bad is the bad thing if it happens, and this is huge, and how likely is it to happen? Not very, but a small percentage chance of a big disaster is something worth waiting about. So I think what we'll see in the next few months is a, a, a barring some provocation, 
of some exogenous event, we'll see a calibrated response. We've seen China restate its usual positions, um, but I think you'll wait for the inaugural speech uh, from the new president to see what the longer term reaction is. So um, that's two legs of the triangle. Um, the uh, well, or maybe one leg of the triangle. The other two involve the United States, the essentially the crucial third party in um, in cross strait relations. And here, um, I think what you've seen is a long term trend of increased bipartisan support in the states for Taiwan. Uh, if you look over the history of this. Taiwan Relations Act was passed in 1979 as the framework substitute for what Taiwan had just lost in terms of security uh, guarantees and formal uh, diplomatic relations. And that was basically it almost for a very long time. Congress introduced hundreds of bills. None of them got anywhere. And then starting in 2016, you got piece after piece of legislation that actually passed that were expressing support for Taiwan on everything from military hardware to political cooperation to just endorsement of, of Taiwan's participation on the international stage. And once Biden came to office, uh, there were statements that were seen as really pushing the envelope of the U.S.'s longstanding policy of strategic ambiguity. If Taiwan is attacked by China without provocation, the U.S. will send its troops, unlike what it did in Ukraine. Um, and that the, uh, the, uh, the U.S. has this essentially ally-like, although certainly not ally commitment. And you've seen the U.S. say that, that this is an undertaking not just bilaterally of the U.S. supporting Taiwan, that's unilateral, but instead is an attempt to gather like-minded states to, uh, to essentially align with the to position that pushes back against China on Taiwan. So you see statements at the G7, statements at NATO, and various other context statements from the EU as well. Uh, and it also gets folded into the U.S. agenda of protecting a rules-based international order that, that is against the use of force to change political status quo and so on. So these are essentially attempts of the U.S. to leverage other states and broader principles uh, to help shore up uh, support for Taiwan. That's partly about protecting Taiwan. I think it's also that we have a very different mindset than we did a couple of decades ago about Taiwan's place in U.S.-China relations. If you don't walk back to the Chen Shui-bian years, I think it was basically... U.S.-China relations are pretty good, and if they're going to get messed up, it's because China's going to do something. And now the view is U.S.-China relations are pretty terrible, uh, and getting, make, getting the Taiwan situation slightly better or slightly worse isn't really going to change anything. And in some U.S. discussions, it's really reached the point of, uh, reached the point of talking about Taiwan as a strategic asset in, if not an inevitable conflict, at least a long-term adversarial relationship with China. So that's the sort of surface stuff. And I think underneath the surface, there's, again, a, a broader, deeper picture here, which is less discontinuous than some of the media coverage would suggest. I actually don't think the U.S. position has changed profoundly on this. The um, U.S. Uh, position is, I think, still ultimately one of strategic ambiguity. If by strategic ambiguity you mean the U.S. doesn't want to commit itself one way or another in a bunch of imaginable situations, uh, but the clarity part of strategic ambiguity is if there's an unprovoked attack or unprovoked coercion even um, of Taiwan by China, then the U.S. will back. If Taiwan goes too far to formal independence, the U.S. will not back Taiwan. So it will sit in judgment on who is the bad guy in a cross-strait crisis. So it's really a logic of dual deterrence, deterring China from coercion and violence, deterring Taiwan from provoking uh, actions by China primarily through formal independence. The thing is, in the last 16 years, there's been no need for the U.S. to deter Taiwan. It really hasn't been doing much, but the U.S. has seen an increasing need to deter China. So what you see is the logic of deterrence focusing on dealing with a more powerful and assertive China and not needing to constrain a more moderate and restrained um, Taiwan. So what that um, means is that, that we've gotten into something that is not, in technical international relations terms, a security dilemma, but is almost a sort of psychological equivalent of a security dilemma. That is, the U.S. now uh, views um, what it is doing as primarily status quo protecting. You lean more toward Taiwan, you're tougher on China, you take stronger language toward China, you look like you're you're just uh, focused on that side of deterrence because the view is China is being assertive and China has more uh, power with which to achieve its ends, both through threats of military coercion and through alignment 
with states that will back it in international organizations. So the U.S. sees China as threatening the status quo by trying to squeeze Taiwan through gray zone and through international uh, marginalization. And so the U.S. responds to that by upping the threat level and by recognizing the U.S.'s own declining power relatively by gathering around like-minded states and by seeing the international rules that bind these states together are a way of pushing back collectively against what are seen as a stronger and more assertive set of actions by China. On the other hand, China looks at that and says, hey, wait a minute, you're hollowing out the one China policy. How come you almost never use the phrase anymore? How come you're not worried about talking uh, about how Taiwan should be pushing the envelope and needs to restrain itself? Why one-sided deterrence? And uh, you, what you're really doing, U.S., is you're suborning Taiwan independence. You're looking the other way about Tsai Ing-wen and those other Taiwanese step by step sneak out toward independence, creeping independence, slow independence, stealthy independence, gradual independence. You can find all those phrases. And the U.S. is either blind to that or worse yet, is doing a nudge, nudge, wink, wink and encouraging it. And all this talk of like-minded states and all these things that come into G7s and EU statements and NATO statements is about encircling China. It's like NATO toward Putin on uh, Putin's view of that. So China says, you know, hey, you're out to, to, to get us here in a kind of neo-Cold War thing. So each side sees itself as trying to protect uh, the other, try to take against the other's attempt to change the status quo. And I think that will continue as well. Last, that last slide uh, is the road ahead. We've got some bumpy mileposts coming up. When I was in Taiwan, lots of people said, isn't this a consequential election because it will prove the DPP will rule forever? And you know, isn't that bad? What will China do? Uh, as, as Li Cheng's quote of the, uh, the Eurasia report, uh, I think accurately conveys, it's not at the top of the list, but there are uh, some things uh, going here that, that the one has to pay attention to. So one that's not on the slide here, I think, <clears throat> um, well, I shall do, yeah. Uh, is, let me take this a little bit out of order. Um, Taiwan's next election, I think, is going to be actually more pivotal than this one. My sense from being in Beijing a couple of times for several days, which is, you know, admittedly a small sample, uh, but that plus what one reads in the media, a sense that, that Beijing was kind of resigned to the idea that Lai Qingdo was going to win. It wasn't seen as a, you know, really crisis moment, either because he's been restrained or because it just seemed like there wasn't much else that would happen. A lot of uh, China's Taiwan watchers, however, say it starts to get a little dicier if it looks like Lai is going to get a fourth term, because then really, when is the KMT ever going to come back and doesn't embolden them to go further? And the way Taiwan's election cycles work, the so-called midterm elections actually happen only about 15 months before the next presidential. These are the local elections, the nine and ones, as they're called. And typically, those were seen as a harbinger of what will happen in the next presidential and legislative elections. That correlation is getting less good. But if the DPP does well there, and then you see what looks to be the uh, possible re-election coming up, that could be a significant source of stress. Or if it looks like lies in trouble, and he decides to go to a play to the base strategy by hitting the independent stuff, then that could also be uh, provocative. But I think the real question here also, it's not on the slide, is what about the Guomindang? What do parties do when they lose three elections in a row by trying the same thing and having it not work? I mean, there are complexities, the three last presidential candidates, four if you count Hong Shoju, uh, from, the, uh, from the KMT have you know, been flawed candidates and very different from one another. But there's a real risk that the KMT will look at this and say, we don't need to change. We lost because Joe went off his meds and talked to Deutsche Welle. We lost because Ho Yo Yi wasn't really that good a candidate. I mean, the buzz cut hair dude wasn't doing it. And uh, he, he barely spoke intelligible in some people's views, right? Or uh, we lost because um, uh, Ko Wen was in the race. And if you only could add those 26 points from Ko Wen to the 36 points we got, we win in a walk, a landslide. Not true. Those votes would have gone someplace else. But it's easy to say that. Or we don't have to do much because Lai Ching will mess up. And even if he doesn't mess up, I mean, three terms is one thing, but four, forget about it. I can get four terms in a row. So I think there's a risk of complacency there. Uh, there's also a risk of, therefore, failing to do something to shore up support so the party could shrink to an even more fundamental deep blue base, the old their types taking over, in which case that's really bad. That's bad for Taiwan because it means it doesn't have as robust a two-party democracy. And it's probably bad for cross-strait relations because having to compete for votes uh, is, is not a, a bad thing across the board, especially on fraught issues like that. Then there's the question of Xi Jinping and the 21st Party Congress. Uh, Xi, unlike Tsai and Lai and Biden and Trump, uh, are limited to a maximum of 
Yeah, they're limited to a maximum of two terms. She has made it clear he's not. And the question becomes, you know, when does this legacy thing kick in? When does the idea that you can't postpone this from generation to generation? When does the sense of accumulated drift of Taiwan from China reach the point where China decides to tighten the screws? I told my friends in Taiwan, you should be glad that uh, the term limits were abolished in China because if it's a legacy thing, he's going to be around for a while. Um, but the real consequential near-term election is the U.S. election in November. Uh, and everything I've been saying so far is kind of premised on the idea that the U.S. isn't going to change much. And there are good reasons to think Xi Jinping is not going to change much. I don't think there's a timetable. I don't think we're on the verge of war. I think it would take somebody to cause that. There's not much that, that is going to happen in Taiwan to change because it's pretty deeply committed to continuity. And because the constraints of the electoral system have driven the two parties in Taiwan very close together. Uh, the Orange Menace is another story. Uh, we, we have no idea what a Trump term two is going to look like. I mentioned ambiguity about who would be around Lai. I think Trump term two is going to be more unpredictable than term one. I think Trump has absolutely no feelings either way on Taiwan. Uh, he has complicated feelings toward China. Uh, but at the very least, one thing that, that I think we can predict about a second Trump term is that there will be less uh, focus on coordinating with allies. And there'll be a lot of alienation of allies, and that's very volatile. It means Japan and Korea feel on their own. That creates complicated implications for their their role in any Taiwan scenario. And Japan has gone much closer to Taiwan in recent years. And it means Europe is out of the game. Europe, which is becoming increasingly involved and focused on China issues and China-Taiwan issues, goes back to worrying exclusively about Putin, basically. Uh, so it makes for a much more volatile world. And on the trade side, which has, of course, been one trade and investment side, which has been one of Taiwan's strong suits, it accelerates the difficulties that are already looming over the horizon from de-risking de and decoupling. Yeah, uh, China's a uh, much less uh, important player in Taiwan's trade and investment and the world's trade and investment than it used to be, but it's still huge for Taiwan. Um, and, uh, you know, the, these are sort of disruptive events. With Trump, I think you would find uh, even more uh, disruption of U.S.-China trade, uh, and that uh, both reduces vulnerabilities, but also increases the room for doing uh, provocative things. So with that, I'll stop and listen to Sadao's comments. <laughs>is actually purely academic. Um, because uh, as you mentioned, Jack, uh, two of the three candidates in this election were doc uh, are doctors, or used to be doctors, or, or you know at least went to medical school. Uh, of course, Cohen Zhuo uh, was a much longer period than Lai Qingde. But this is very uh, interesting, right? Especially for me, uh, for people who don't know, uh, I, I, you know, I study fashion naturally interested in, uh, in doctors. So, you know, long before the election, once I noticed that, you know, there was rising in Taiwanese po politics, I st uh, started to ask around in Taiwanese politics. But if you look at the uh, legislative yuan, the Lifa yuan, or doctors that Lai Qingdu and Cohen Zhou, okay? Now, that, I, I just wanted to uh, ask Jack, which one you find more plausible, or maybe you have a fourth answer, right? So, Who is the uh, uh, so-called uh, again? He uh, kind of, uh, took uh, Taiwan from Japan uh, after 1945. There was a massacre of local elites in 1947. During that ma massacre, there you know uh, dozens of uh, doctors and lawyers actually lost, lost their life. Uh, I think KMT killed these. Highly regarded uh, locally, so that historical memory actually carried on. You know, generation to the uh, pro DPP. So that's the first e explanation uh, by some of my friends. The second explanation, um, as an educator, was the fact that uh, the best student, you can get, which is the case, how you know. Medical school or, or school, okay? <laughs> right. So you're in medical school or law school. But I was told by my, some of my Taiwanese friends, uh, during the KMT uh, martial law period, which lasted for 40 years, is the longest martial law. Like, Taiwanese parents were afraid of sending their kids to law school because this law is supposed to be political, right? So medicine, on the other hand, is supposed to be political. Well, actually, a lot of uh, really good students how many students actually went to medical school? Of course, not all, all of those uh, students wanted to become doctors, 
Lai Qingde is a great example, right? So, so once democratization happens, there's a group of young doctors, Lai Qingde included, actually joined the uh, PPP and then you know participated in politics because their their aspiration was never been to practice uh, for uh, for a long time. Example, of course. So that's the second explanation. The third one. Uh, I heard was actually has something to do with the democratization itself, which is uh, during uh, the uh, democratization period, because DPP as a party was founded, uh, it lacked a lot of resources, of course. It couldn't com uh, uh, compare with the KMT, obviously, but also uh, lack expertise and talent, right? So DPP have into the party. So that's why when Chen Shui Bian became, there's a group of doctors actually went into Taiwanese politics. Right? Lai Qingde actually, you know, joined politics in 1990. The early generation of doctors actually joined the DPP, right? So that's I think the third explanation. So, so I just want to ask Jack, you know, um, what your view about this? Why there's so many doctors in Taiwanese politics, especially in this election? Uh, you all turn the microphone. Yeah, I think if, if if I drop my voice, I'll go back to the microphone. It's just I think it's making us all a little crazy. Uh, is that does that affect recording? Or are we okay? We're okay. All right. So um, so that, I mean, I think you know one always has a taste to generalize from a relatively small man. It was two doctors and a cop. Uh, so who knows? Um, two out of three, right? The super majority. So I would say a few things. I mean, most Taiwanese presidents have been lawyers. Uh, well, was one agricultural economist. Uh, but in the democratic period, uh, Chen Shui-bian, Ma Ying-jun, and, and uh, Tsai Ing-wen are all trained as lawyers. Now, rather different lawyers. Chen Shui-bian was essentially a movement lawyer. He defended the Gaoxiong. He defended the, uh, the Gaoxiong set uh, of of defendants in in you know the, the, after the incident uh, there. Uh, and Tsai Ing-wen was very much a kind of establishment um, international lawyer of international trade. And of course, Ma was an international lawyer of, of a different sort, um, somewhat more academic background. But uh, so, you know, but but I take the point. The professions loom very large, um, and I think that's not at all atypical of a lot of of systems that have you know non guerrilla revolutions, right? Where there's essentially a a, a fairly soft decolonization. There's the internal split between the KMT and the DPP. And you're right. A lot of the DPP folks were out of professional backgrounds, lawyers and doctors, uh, and a lot of the KMT people because it was a ruling party under an authoritarian regime had people who came up through the ranks. It wasn't electoral politics. It was you know, kind of becoming a government uh, a staffer at some level and work your way up. And that's a largely Ma's story. I mean, he was, you know, mind you, or, um, he was, um, Jiang Jingguo was the interpreter as well as, as advisor and so on. Um, I don't know, maybe Sun Zhongshan, you know, Sun Yat-sen was a doctor, maybe it's a venerable tradition. Um, uh, so, you know, when you've got, when you've got again, a, a, not a guerrilla revolution, but a kind of um, a soft transition, I think, professional elites with the ability to articulate the self-confidence, often the socioeconomic status. Now, Lai is actually from an extremely modest background. He was raised by a single mother after his father died in the coal mines and all of that. Uh, but but I think once he went to Harvard Medical School and all that, he probably came out the other side. Um, but, um, you know, Kilwin Joe will certainly tell you doctors are smart. <laughs> He'll tell you the smartest person in the room. So I think there is a certain amount. I mean, you know, I don't know what it takes to look in the mirror and say, you know, I should be president. Uh, but I think you've got to have a, a certain uh, healthy ego and, you know, doctors and lawyers are, are probably people with with relatively uh, healthy egos. Um, but I but I do think I do think the historical explanation is a lot when you have the kind of transition that Taiwan had where the Dang Wai was very much these people. And then I think the KMT, the new KMT, the KMT that needed to compete democratically kind of mirrored that. And so you saw more prizing of that uh, kind of of, of background. Um, so you mentioned doctors and lawyers. I'd say the other thing are political scientists. There are a lot of them. They aren't in elective office so much, but the, the cabinet in Taiwan has more American PhD political scientists than the American cabinet has ever had. And yet Taiwan has survived. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so if you're asking me to pick among them, I, I really think the explanation is a, a, uh, a path-dependent one that is confirmed by here, extremely soft and casual comparative uh, political science, which is this kind of transition tends to be uh, conducive to that because it doesn't require you to go to the countryside and you know, take up arms. It doesn't require you to work only within the system. And so the kind of skills that I think, and you know this far better than I do, but the kind of skills for lawyers and doctors, which are, which are very autonomous professions. I mean, people sort of uh, prize that kind of autonomy and see themselves as shaping the world rather than working in some hierarchy are probably conducive to the DPP side. And I think the KMT probably winds up mirroring it.
I think I'll just stop. Uh, yeah. So my second question is uh, much that I have. It's actually very practical because uh, you mentioned uh, John, uh, the GPP. Uh, this is uh, their uh, third win in the election, third in the world, right? So uh, I, you know, a lot of many people, I, I think this is actually five prediction, right? I, I mean, actually, I was just uh, talking about the read that four years ago. I basically thought GPP will be in power for a very long time because you know, just look at the alternative. They actually were, you know, it's still we and you know, lack of resources, like the opposite of thirty years ago, right? And also, more importantly, GPP uh, can be really back time. Look at their all their candidates. You know, for, uh, for, for president in uh, recent years, right? So, and, and at the same time, how much of a party do you actually think of coming back to a very good, very bright future, but it's still very, uh, very young and very safe? So, neither of us really trying to see the CPP unless they really come together, which they could. Right? So, I think the CPP will be in power. I think you, you mentioned like you might have uh, uh, another term. I think that's actually quite possible. But then the question is like, um, in terms of governing Taiwan, right? What kind of challenges the DPP will face in the next four years? I mean, I'm not talking about the laws of authority in the legislative guys. I'm talking about it in terms of the actual policy, mm -hmm. you know, of that, that, you know, people in Taiwan care about. What are some of the challenges that they have? Okay, a fair question. Um, so, I mean, I think you're right to point to um, what is an example of the old adage, you can't beat something with nothing. Uh, you know, and the DPP is not terribly impressive as a something anymore. Um, you know, it's got its own internal factional problems and 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 it 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 does have the problem of bearing the, you know, you can't be the party of change when you've been in power for 12 years. Uh, so so I think you know it does have weaknesses, but you're right to say that the KMT has has yet to really le learn any lessons. I actually think that the KMT is is has some people who are down a generation who are who are fairly promising, um, but you know they're 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 several steps away. Um, uh, the 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 uh, DPP has a deeper near term bench, but those people who are the younger folks in the KMT uh, are not going to generation skip. I mean, the KMT is a little too hierarchical for that, and these people are too light blue, too open to you know same sex marriage, to uh, to walking much farther away from one China principles and things like that. Um, you know, mayor of Taipei, I think, is somebody of the following generation. The mayor of of uh, Taichung is another possibility. So there are people out there, but but there th there's a cork in the bottle. And for Koenjo, I'm actually less optimistic about the future of that party. I think uh, you know, that party is so uninstitutionalized. The campaign was social media. It's got no grassroots basis. It tapped into youth discontent. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it tapped into something that's there, but I, I don't think they're anywhere near establishing a long-term viable, uh, viable party, but they might. Um, I think we'll, we'll learn more about that in, in the near future when they sort out the legislative politics. But whether these people will be disciplined, even the eight, whether they'll be disciplined followers of Ke, and then if you can build a, a lasting movement. I mean, you know, the thing with Ke is he said everything about everything. It was on all sides of every issue, and he just had this vibe, you know, I alone can fix it kind of thing. I would say that's not sustainable, but what do I know? Um, <laughs> Um, so what are the, the near term governing challenges? Um, you know, I mean, as, as you know, it's a cheap one to say, you've got a minority in the legislature and that's going to make it hard to get things passed. That is true, but a majority in the legislature doesn't guarantee you get things passed. Ma Ying Jiu learned that with Wang Jinping as, as legislative Yen chair. And again, it's, it's a, a parliamentary system that by, by internal norms and processes allows a fairly small number to, to gum up the work. So you can't take that as an excuse to waste that. So, so where are the problems? I think the biggest structural problem is that basically a government in Taiwan lacks agency in two senses. It can't control the big external stuff. It can do things to mess it up, but it, it, its agency is limited vis-a-vis -vis China and the United States in terms of, of what it can do uh, to secure itself from external threats and to raise its, its uh, position in the international stage, and even to do things that will help Taiwan economically. It can't get FTAs. It can't get into the major multilateral trade agreements. So that whole avenue of trying to fix things is, is very, very hard. And domestically, I think there's a real problem that basically nobody in Taiwan's democratic period has found a way to get policies that are as close to social democracy as the voters seem to want. Ultimately, politics is stuck in a pretty pro-business mode, uh, anti-high tax, anti-major restructuring, um, you know, pro-keeping some SMEs afloat, things like that. And I think it's just nobody's yet really figured out a way to, or even tried, I think, very hard to do it, which is part of the gridlock I had on those earlier slides. It's not just that the temptation, the cheap temptation in politics is to say, well, you may have policy, medical, but, but they're going to mess up the cross street things. We're all going to die or something like that, right? Uh, you can try that um, because nothing else really works. And I think that's the problem. I think, I, I think if you really got these guys in a room and said, 
come on, you're really going to pass something that creates these kinds of large scale at the same time, child care incentives, uh, mortgage support, um, you know, uh, generous health care without raising taxes. I mean, the U.S. does that, too. I think it's even more, more extreme in Taiwan. So I think if you have another four years where there's no movement on that stuff, and if cross straits doesn't blow up, then I think the party is going to face a reckoning on that front. The, the issue, though, is who is going to step in and offer an alternative? The KMT is not going to pass the DPP on this, uh, this the progressive left. They've barely stomached, you know, same-sex marriage, gender equality, stuff like that. And then their proposals are much lower tax, less redistributionist. Cook could try to claim that mantle. But again, is he going to have a party that can do it? And is anybody going to believe him? If his pitch basically is, I, I know what I'm doing here. I'm the smartest guy in the room. Trust me. That was in heavy quotation marks. Well, yeah. Third question. <laughs> okay. My third and final question, then we'll open up the floor for discussion. It's probably the question uh, online and many, uh, me and many uh, other people in this group, which is called the type of group, right? So, so, I mean, of course, in recent years, I think uh, in both the uh, Western media and the Chinese media, there are a lot of discussion about of the type of war, uh, war uh, uh, you know, across the strain, right? So, so I mean, it, it, there's so much been talking about war in the past three years. I almost felt like, I don't know whether the Chinese government wants the war or the Western media wants the war. <laughs> I feel like the media wants the war more than the government. Yeah. So, but, but it is, uh, it's, it is an issue that I think uh, that uh, many of us are thinking about, right? So I just want to ask your view about it. My personal view is that I don't think there will be, and I certainly hope there won't be more. Uh, oh, I don't know if it's more informed analysis. Like it's, it's all it's all pretty speculative. Uh, but um, I think the I think the probability is fairly low. Um, I mean, I I think there's there's zero evidence that 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 Xi Jinping has a fixed time frame. There was a lot of irresponsible media reporting that when he said the PLA has to have the capacity by 2027 uh, to take action, that doesn't mean you have to use it. Now, there, that, that creates a dynamic, of course, because if China is, is bent on building that capacity and if the U.S. wants to be able to protect Taiwan and certain contingencies or to have the ability to protect Taiwan such that it doesn't lose the confidence of Korea and Japan, who are formal treaty allies, and even more the Philippines, which has kind of gotten back on the U.S. side in some of this, then you, know, then you see the U.S. arms build up and you, you know, that, that, that creates um, some degree of tension. The other thing that I think has led to um, excessive uh, war hand-wringing is that uh, the U.S. Defense Department has a big pot of money it's been putting into war games. And your war games are useful. I mean, they, they really help you think through bad contingencies, and it's the responsibility of the Defense Department to think of these things, which is why you know, the 2027 thing got a little out of hand, right? It is the responsible thing for a Department of Defense, the Ministry of National Defense, to do to prepare for the bad contingency, and China's buildup is a bad contingency potentially. So you have to figure out things to do about that, which is why 2027 became a crucial date for the U.S. Department of Defense. But that doesn't mean the so-called Davidson window slams shut uh, and the war starts in 2027. So what happens with these war games is, um, first of all, war games suck some of, the, some of the energy and all the money out of the room. So the think tank land does war games. It doesn't think about diplomatic scenarios. It doesn't think about what you can do in the softer areas as much. And a war game only gets interesting if you get war. And a war game that gets to war only gets interesting if you sometimes lose. And so a bunch of these war games, you, know, you, you set them up. They're, they're artificial creations. They have to be plausible. But there was this, this series of war games which were designed to really essentially stress test the US policy and responses. And that means you want some of them to come out badly. Like Rand when one that got a lot of attention. And so basically, of course, the US loses some of these. And then the story becomes China is bent on starting the war in 2027 and the US will lose. So therefore, the US will not ride to Taiwan's rescue. The email Lun, the, the suspicion that America will not support Taiwan then takes hold. And what does the US do? That it has to reassure Taiwan we're really going to be there. We reassure Taiwan we're really going to be there. And China says, wait a second, you're now supporting independence. So you get into this nasty feedback loop, which creates a lot of noise. I, I like to think and I believe that you know that doesn't trigger reality. So so where are the risks then? I mean I think the only the real risks of war are or the real risks of conflict are accidental perhaps. And this is a bigger, I think, challenge in the South China Sea than the, than the immediate Taiwan area, where you've got a lot of, you know, big guns and ships and planes operating um, very close to one another without a lot of rules of the game. And with, you know, frankly, I think China pushing some of the behavioral norms in the area and certainly a weaker crisis communication system than we had with the Soviets back in the day. Um, and, you know, the, what is China's go point? I think if Xi Jinping or whoever succeeds Xi when he goes to meet Mao, um, is um, believes that the window, the possibility of peaceful unification is definitely gone. 
even a fairly loose one. I mean, not an equal the based on Hong Kong, but, but some kind. If that's gone, and if time is no longer on China's side. Beijing's view, I think, for many years is now has been basically time's on China's side. The belief was deepening economic integration with Taiwan would give it leverage. Taiwan would not have an interest in blowing things up, and maybe you could press towards a solution. China was becoming relatively strong compared to the United States. Eventually, you know, the tractor beams would work. That confidence has been shaken because of all sorts of events, including a sour attitude toward unification uh, in Taiwan. But I don't think it's been shaken so badly that China thinks that it is facing a moment when it becomes clear that there is no hope. And I think it's in Taiwan's interest to keep that hope alive. It's certainly the official U.S. position, even though some people think of Taiwan as a strategic asset against China. The official position remains, if you guys can work out unification, God bless it. You know, or if it's peaceful, we'll do it. So, so the other thing, of course, is that, um, that um, if China, the, the China, I think, now thinks, and I think this is accurate, that... Um, there's more, let me put it this way. There is more confidence in Beijing that the US will ride to Taiwan's rescue than there is confidence in Taiwan that, Taiwan, that the US will ride to Taiwan's rescue. Um, and so if that, if you know, Yi Mei is very powerful in Taiwan, it's not so powerful in China. So I think that, that, that if you see China reach the go point, it would be very scary because it would not be under the illusion that China could take serious coercive measures against uh, Taiwan without suffering huge consequences of economic sanctions and disruption. That's good news in that that's, I think that cost benefit analysis matters to Xi and whoever else is making decisions. But it does mean that if we get to the point where we're, we're at the tipping point, then it gets scary because the huge costs economically and the likelihood of a war that involves the US and Japan are already factored in. One, my, one final thing, looping back to the earlier point about accidental war. I think accidental conflict spiraling into not a war, but a bigger conflict is bigger in the South China Sea. What you have to worry about in the um, in the cross strait situation is misreading of uh, accelerated gray zone tactics. Uh, how do you know what is a really big war game versus preparation for the actual move? What if China does a soft blockade? You know, how do you push back against that? Um, those kinds of things, I think, are uh, the more likely tactics China would use if it got more coercive toward Taiwan, and are the ones that create these real sort of ladders of escalation problems that can be very hard to control. Uh,